Hey, hello, hello. I'm on mute. Is this muted? Muted, 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 muted. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> hmm. Testing. Oh, the lost sun. <laughs> you got the bad end of the market. <clears throat> Hello. This is on. Testing, testing. Hmm? Hello? Is sound coming out? There we go. Something just, yeah, there we go. We have power. All right, good evening, and thank you for those of you who are joining us about Facebook Live. And if you would stand as we sing Our God. What are you turned into wine? Open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Let's pray. Father, and we just come to you, and Lord, thank you that you um, are an awesome God, and Lord, that you um, are awesome in power, that you are a healer. And, Lord, that you are higher than any other. And, um, God, I pray that you would help us to um, realize that in our everyday lives and help us to um, live that out. And, Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to be um, good witnesses for you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you. And you can be seated. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine Awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place. Mighty God, you are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, Mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Mighty God. 
You are awesome in this place, mighty God. At this time, the men can come forward for prayer time. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence once again. We're here tonight, Lord. We come together to, to hear your word, to sing songs of praise unto your name. And Lord, so, so very grateful for the privilege of prayer that we have. As this prayer goes up right now, Lord. Let us pray that our hearts are attuned to your will for our lives. Father, that we will feel the Spirit move in our midst tonight as we're here. We ask you to be with Brother Wayne, Lord. Give him just the words that uh, will touch our hearts, that will lead us along the way tonight as we seek your face, Lord. It's so very thankful for prayer, Lord, knowing that you hear our prayers. Let our prayers be sincere. Let our prayer be real unto you, Lord, as we think about you and what you would have us to do, the people you would have us to be. Let us always remember, Lord, that it's about you. It's not about us. Help us to keep you in the forefront in all our lives. Lord, we remember those that need you in special ways. They abound all around us. and We lift them up to you. We pray for your perfect will in each life as we pray for that in our own lives right here tonight. We ask you to continue to be with us, Lord. Lead us, guide us, direct us as you would always have us to go, that you would have us to do the things you would have us to do. We love you, Lord. We ask you to forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. 
I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you. Yeah, okay, now we're in business. We ever get the preacher straight now, we can, we can do it. Thank y'all. I realize that we are entering into uh, the summer. I have always felt that I was a realist, hopefully. And I expect attendance to drop a little bit in the summer because it did so all 50-something years I was a pastor. People are going to take vacations. They deserve to do that. and uh, So uh, our numbers may drop a little, but we've got a good group here tonight, and I thank you for being in attendance for the summertime. And I hope you've had a good day. Tonight I'm going to ante up. Ever since I've come to be your interim pastor, I suppose nine out of ten times I've gone a little over preaching. Don't say amen, please. Been a little long-winded. Even made a few promises that I was going to shorten it down a little, get it back to a reasonable time frame. 
and uh, probably haven't done very good at that. But tonight, I hope to give you a little bit back. Uh, I am uh, extra tired tonight. Don't feel sorry for me. It's a good tired. We've been through Bible school and other things. My dear friend, uh, Judge Graydon Kitchens, passed away uh, early afternoon. And uh, I've got to go home and begin the task of working on a funeral message. I've been asked to do the eulogy. That's where you talk about the person's life. I'd rather preach the message. How do you sum up a life, especially like that one? You can never do it justice. So I've got to get on that assignment. I have a few other commitments before the funeral Wednesday morning. And uh, I'm a little behind on uh, getting to those eulogy remarks, but be praying for the Kitchens family. Uh, Minden has lost one of its greatest leaders for a long time in that city. And then our Southern Baptist Convention begins. Pastors Conference, WMU, all those things starting probably tonight and then through tomorrow and the convention beginning on Tuesday and Wednesday. And I'm not sure, but maybe a little over into Thursday. So pray that messengers that are there will be led by the Lord. And when the dust settles, good decisions will be made. Not foolish decisions, wrong decisions, things that hurt us. So pray for our convention. John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. John 2, 1 through 11. A familiar passage of Scripture. I'm reading from the King James tonight. You listen, follow along if you have your copy of the Scriptures. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and His disciples to the marriage. Uh, Not all of His disciples attended. If you read further down in the chapter, verse 35, Jesus is at this wedding and there are five disciples that we know of that are there. Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and John, verse 35, reveals that they are present. So Jesus had been invited along with His mother and some of His close disciples. And when they wanted... Wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkings apiece. Jesus said to them, said to them, the servants, fill the water pots with water. And they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. Go to the maitre d'ee. Let him sample this and uh, let him know he's got more wine. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the wine that was made, water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine till now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory and His disciples believed on Him. May God bless the reading of His Word. It's early in the ministry of Jesus. 
He's been invited to a wedding. This is significant. He goes. If you study this in depth, you will find that he walked approximately six miles to get to the wedding. He and his disciples. You know what that says to me? Jesus thought that weddings and marriage was important. We're living in a day when some people think they have a better idea and they choose to just live in. They choose not to be married. Our oh, wedding's just a formality. And Jesus would say that's not the case. Never underestimate the importance of a wedding and marriage. So important, he walked six miles to go to one. Now, when he arrives at the wedding, his mother's there. Most Bible scholars believe that Mary was the sister of the bridegroom's mother. This would explain Mary's interest in what's going on there. It's her sister's wedding for her daughter. It would also explain another reason why Jesus went to the wedding. One of mom's kinfolks. Now, the wedding celebration in Palestine was the grand event for a couple. The celebration would last usually at least a week. It wasn't coming together for a wedding rehearsal one night and a wedding the next day or something like that, and we all go home. And the groom in that day and time was financially responsible for the wedding. Now, a Jewish wedding feast, which lasted over a week, always served wine. It was an essential for a Jewish wedding. They felt it was appropriate. Wine symbolized joy. And it symbolized exhilaration. And that's what ought to be going on at a wedding. So wine was always available at a wedding in Palestine. And only the priest who was officiating over the wedding would abstain. Oh yes, there was another group that would abstain. The Nazarites, those who had taken the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow said we won't ever cut our hair. And they would never drink wine. So at that wedding, the priest wouldn't be drinking. And those who had taken the Nazarite vow wouldn't be drinking. But most other adults would drink the wine. There was a Jewish saying that's well known and recorded in history, without wine there is no joy. Well, if that's the case, then I've never had any joy because... I've never had any wine. I'm not knocking anybody who has. So now you get the picture. Wine's important at this wedding. And they're running out of it. And this thing lasts a week or so. And the servants are becoming concerned. They're alarmed. The couple will never live this down if they run out of wine. It will be a social disaster. It will be shame for them to run out of the refreshments. It will be a breakdown in hospitality. So something needed to be done. Something to alleviate the shortage of the beverage. Mary is aware that we got a problem here. And she turns to her son Jesus in verse 5 and she says, They have no wine. It's almost gone already. We hadn't got started with this celebration real good. You can read it in between the lines. Now she obviously had confidence in her son's power 
to solve problems. It's always good to turn to Jesus when you've got a problem. But remember, she's never seen him perform a miracle before. He's just really starting his ministry. She does treasure in her heart some unusual things about her son. She remembers that the angels came and told her, don't worry about your conception. You have conceived of the Holy Ghost. And so the angel told her that that which was inside her was God's work. And she knew he was very special. She also had experienced the visits of the shepherds, the wise men. She had heard the songs of Anna and Simeon. She had listened to the dialogue of her 12-year-old son with PhDs. She had known for many years, there's really something special about this boy. God's got something special for him. She's believing he's God's anointed, the Messiah that's been sent, but she's never seen him do a miracle. Now, please keep in mind at this point, Mary has probably been a widow for a number of years. She lost her husband some years before this. He's not at the wedding with her, of course. And Jesus was her firstborn, born of the virgin. She would later have other children by natural conception. Jesus was her oldest, and she would turn to Him whenever she had a problem in their home at Nazareth. And so it's only natural that with her confidence that He's unusual, and He can handle a crisis. He's done it at home many times. She sends out an SOS. They have no wine. Jesus answers her with what has to be understood as a gentle rebuke. Gentle rebuke. This is his mother. He uses the word woman. That is not the rebuke. From citation, citations we read in ancient manuscripts... That was the proper way to address your mother. It was like saying, ma'am. And on the cross, you'll remember, he gave John instructions to take care of his mother, and he referred to her again as, woman, behold your son. John's now going to be like a son in your life. And he called her woman again. No disrespect in using that term. But he is gently rebuking her. He is saying to her, What have I to do with thee? No rudeness. Just said, You're running ahead of schedule for me. This is not the time for me to reveal who I am. This is not the time. That's what's going on here. Mary is wishing he'd use this occasion to show who he is. Messiah, have power, miracle working guy. Because the Messiah would do those things. And Jesus is basically saying, Now woman, my, my time's not yet come. This is not really the best time. Let me do it my way, mother. A little gentle rebuke. But no disrespect. Now, I've got to stop here and say, I I read between the lines sometimes when I read Scripture. Don't you know Mary is wanting Him to do miracles to prove to everybody He's the Messiah, the Son of God, and it will add credibility to her story that she gave birth as a virgin. She's wanting to get her name cleared a little bit. There's a little selfishness in here. Come on, Jesus, crank it up a little bit so they'll know who you really are. I've known for a long time. But these people have always looked with me with suspicion like I've been an immoral lady. But you can prove them wrong if you do one of those miracles. They'll begin to see and start believing what I told them. 
I can't help but believe a little of that's in the back of her mind. Anyway, I just throw that out from the what it's worth department. Mary ends up saying in verse 5, Whatever he says, whatever he says, do you do it? She says that to the servants. Now, they're standing nearby six large stone water jugs used for purification purposes. Verse 6. When people would travel and arrive at a home, get ready to eat a meal, they had to wash their hands thoroughly. Ever seen a surgeon really work on those hands? They had to wash their hands thoroughly or if they ate without washing their hands, they were considered ceremonially unclean. And they'd have to stay away from going to the temple for a period of time. These pots were used for washing purposes. And Jesus ordered the servants to fill the jars. They were not full. Six big jars. Notice verse 7, he says, fill them to the brim. So they were not full. They had room for more water. The fact that Jesus said fill it to the brim, I think there's a reason for that. Because when he's getting ready to turn this water to wine, it's pretty clear that nothing else can be added like Kool-Aid or something to make grape juice or something to play a trick because it's already full of water. There's no room to add anything else. And so he says, fill it to the top. And then after they did that, Jesus said in verse 8 to the servants, he said, now you carry the contents now to the maitre d' and let him taste it. So they got some and they carried it to him and he tasted it. And he said, you have kept the good wine until now, verse 10. The maitre d' declares that this is a high caliber of wine. When Jesus does something, He always does it good. He does it right. The wine was top quality. And it came in great quantity. Not only great quality, but great quantity. Notice verse 6. These six water jars... Each contained two or three firkins, the Scripture says. A firking measurement was eight and a half gallons, one firkin. So we don't know exactly the sizes were different to some of those jugs. And they contained two or three firkins apiece. And if you do the math on that, if a firkin's eight and a half gallons... Each jar would contain between 17 and 25 gallons. The NIV, when you read it, talks about 20 to 30 gallons. So if you do the math, six jars with a total capacity, get this, between 100 and 150 gallons of wine. Now don't stop there. If you pour a glass for each person at the wedding, and say you give them a half a pint, based on this figure here, between 100 and 150 gallons you gave each serving a half a pint, that's enough for 1,600 to 2,400 servings. Jesus created this wine, turned water to wine, in superabundance. You may wonder why He made all that wine. Well, they're staying there about a week, but that's still too much. It's Wayne Dubose's personal opinion. You don't have to agree with me because I might be wrong. But he made it so a lot would be left over as a wedding gift for the marriage couple. That's what I'm going to say. You do with it what you want to. Now, the maitre d' at first attributed this good wine to the groom. Read verse 9 through 10. 
said, boy, this groom, he's done something. He saved this inferior, served the inferior wine first and gave the good stuff later. That's not the way people usually do it. He thinks the groom has set it up this way. The servants know the difference. They know the real facts. Verse 9. And basically they say, well, here's what we know. We poured in water and then we poured out wine. We just did what Jesus told us to do. And in that miracle of turning water to wine, the Lord is exalted. The faith of His followers are increased. John sums it up in verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth His glory and His disciples believed on Him. They believed more and more. This really is the Messiah. Their faith is basically growing in who Jesus is. Now, I believe this miracle happened. John was an eyewitness, the one who's writing this gospel. If you doubt his report, then you are striking a blow against the authenticity of the gospel of John. You're saying he stretched the truth, a total lie. He's an eyewitness, he saw it. And if I'm going to believe everything else he says in this book, I'm going to have to believe this too. We're in trouble if he told a lie. Let me make a few comments about wine drinking in the New Testament. People always asking preachers questions. Brother Wayne, did Jesus drink wine? Brother Wayne, was it intoxicating, the wine he drank? Brother Wayne, does this episode of Jesus turning water to wine give believers permission then to drink wine and alcoholic beverages? Let me give you some observations from my knowledge and study of the Scriptures and from my heart. Number one, the wine here at this wedding is more than grape juice. Now, some Baptists want to make it that, and I understand that. I'm a teetotaler. I always have been. But I'm also honest with Scripture. This wine, quite frankly, could affect the senses of a person if they drink a lot, a lot, a lot of it. Verse 10 bears that out. It says the normal procedure is you have your best wine first and then when people are a little lightheaded and a little giddy and everything, they're just a, their senses aren't all that sharp. Bring in that cheap stuff. So doesn't that tell you that the beverage at the, wine, at the wedding could affect one's senses? So we're not talking about grape juice here. And that's, that's very important to me as we get started. It is called in this passage, the wine that Jesus made, good wine. That's what the Bible says it is. It didn't say good grape juice. Good wine. Did Jesus drink the wine of His day? Notice what I said, the wine of His day. Probably He did, but He was not a wine bibber. Read your Bible. Jesus would go and eat meals with folks. And some of them that didn't like him started saying, he's a wine bibber. That means a person that drank too much wine and got intoxicated. Never was that the case. He was not a wine bibber. Now you've got to stay with me tonight. Don't you go out and misquote me. I'll find out where you live. And so I begin by telling you the wine at the wedding, Jewish wedding, is a little more than grape juice. And Jesus probably drank the wine of His day because water was a problem and all the most vast resources of water in that day were mixed with a little wine to get rid of the odor and to help the taste. And it was just 
a common thing. Jesus probably drank the wine of his day. So when you quote me, you be sure you say that and stay with me. A clear distinction, number two, should be made between wine as we know it today and the wine in Jesus' day. There's a similarity and there's a difference. The wine at that time could be intoxicating. If you drank a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of it, I say that purposely and you'll know why in a minute. The wine in his day was mixed with water. It was heavily, heavy diluted. The ratio was usually three parts water to one part wine. Sometimes it was four parts water to one part wine. If you read the Talmud, and you, the Talmud tells you what the wine was they used in the Passover. Three parts water, one part wine. And that was the wine in Jesus' day. When the ratio dropped one to one, it moves from the term wine to strong drink in your Bible. There's a distinction in the Bible between wine and strong drink. Listen to Leviticus 10, 9. Leviticus 10 and verse 9. About the priest it said, Do not drink wine. Priest. He spoke to Aaron, the priest said that. Do not drink wine, nor strong drink. They're not the same thing. They're two different things. In Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Listen to this. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Notice two different things. Wine and strong drink are two different things. Wine is a mocker. In other words, if you tarry too long at the wine, it can give you false courage. It will mock you. Strong drink is raging. Boy, that's, that's something. Hard liquor will lead you into brawls. It's raging. But the point is, yeah, all through your Bible, there's a difference between wine and strong drink. Now, why did I point that out? Wine was a mixture, heavy, diluted in Jesus' day with water. The strong drink became one to one, not four to one or three to one. And I think what you need to understand is this. This wine is more than grape juice. There is a distinction between the two, wine and strong drink. And number three, it is possible to become intoxicating using the wine in the New Testament, but it's highly unlikely. I want to read you an article from Christianity Today entitled, Wine Drinking in New Testament Times by Robert Stein. Are you listening? Quote, To consume the amount of alcohol that is in two martinis, by drinking wine to get the same amount you could get in two martinis, uh, and the wine having three parts water and one part wine, you would have to drink over 22 glasses to get as much alcohol as you get in two martinis if you're drinking New Testament wine. In other words, Dr. Steen said, it is possible to become intoxicated with the wine here in the New Testament Wine mixed with three parts of water, but one's drinking would probably affect the bladder long before it affects the mind. Were you listening? Now here's an expert talking about the wine in New Testament days. The wine's a little more than grape juice for sure. And there's a difference between wine and strong drink. 
And it's possible you could get in trouble drinking New Testament wine, get intoxicated. But it's so different from what people are consuming today. By the way, for your information, in 476 A.D., wine stopped being majorly watered down. Up until 476 years after Christ, wine was majorly watered down. And that's why I can tell you that when Jesus made the wine, He made it to match what they had at the wedding feast, three parts water and one part wine. The next thing I'd say is the ordinary table beverage in the Mediterranean world and in Roman times was wine mixed with water. And it was used as a beverage to drink because water was unsafe. They mixed it. To boil water was toilsome. To boil water was costly. And the easiest way to make water safe was to mix some wine with it. Now, here's the thing I want you to take home. The drinking of wine mixed with water in Bible times does not encourage wine drinking today. You're not comparing apples with apples. In our day, the alcohol content of distilled spirits is anywhere from three to ten times greater. And more like ten times greater. If people frowned, if people frowned on drinking strong drink, Back in Bible times, what do you think they'd do today with this strong stuff that people are taking? I want to tell you something. I'm, I've never regretted my decision to leave alcohol alone. I pastored some people who take a social drink. They say to me, preacher, that's not a sin as long as I don't get drunk. Modesty and everything. I don't even argue with them. I just say, I love you, brother or sister. But when I faced that issue years ago, I made a decision. I was going to leave it alone for a lot of what I think are good reasons. We never know our propensity, how we're made up, our DNA and everything. We never know that taking that first one, we might get, at last it biteth like an adder, it says. And I look around and every time I think about alcohol, most of the time, all the time, it just is a problem to people. You realize how many people die every year? Alcohol related accidents. Over 50,000 a year. The health problems caused by drinking. Every now and then they'll come out and say, well, wine will help you with this, wine will help you with this. Hey, there are more negative side effects than positive. Be careful. I want to read you something. I want to get you out a little early. I got to hurry, Ed. You think about this. Have you? Just think about this a minute. I'm proud that I've left it alone. Have you ever known a man to lose his job because he drank too little? I heard a man say one time, "My boss fired me because I wouldn't drink with him." So he may be an exception. But I've never really known people who got fired because they drank too little. What does that say? Have you ever known an employer who picked men for responsible positions in their company because they drank constantly? Never known one. Have you ever heard a wife say, My husband will be the best husband in the world if he'd just start drinking? You ever heard that? No, you haven't. What does that tell you? While we're on the subject, what insurance company do you know offers reduced rates for drinkers? I like my position better than yours if you have a different one. Did you ever hear of an alcoholic when he began drinking to say, it will happen to me? They also, it won't happen to me, I can handle it. Did you ever hear a coach encourages men to drink a lot before a game? Now, he may have gone out after the game and drank with them, but not before the game. 
Have you ever heard children complain because their daddy never came home drunk? I haven't. Did you ever hear a drunk who boasted, I can take a drink or leave it alone? Whoever really did leave it alone? I could go on and on, but food for thought. I'm just simply saying, be careful before you get real liberal about alcohol. The teetotaler position may not be as dumb as you want to make it out. I have as much fun at an Alabama LSU game as those guys that are high, and I remember the next day what happened, and they don't. Just thought I'd throw that in. So don't use this thing, Jesus turned water to wine, so okay, drink wine today. The two are different. New Testament day wine was watered down, watered down, watered, compared to this alcohol stuff today. It's not apples with apples and oranges with oranges. Three quick statements, and I'm going to go home. What do we learn about Jesus here? He's no party pooper. He's no killjoy. He shows up at a wedding. They run out of refreshments. And he says, I don't want the celebration to stop. And he turns water to wine. He's not a party pooper. Let the celebration go on. You know, some people associate Christianity with black clothes and long faces. John Wesley had schools for children in Bristol, England one of his big schools, and he had a grim code of conduct for the children in his school. He would not let them play any games. They never observed holidays. And he gave the impression that sadness equals spirituality. He gave the impression that gloom indicates godliness, and nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus was a social person. He'd eat with folks. And he wasn't a wine bibber. But he fellowshiped with folks. And he said, let, let the celebration continue. No party pooper. Second thing about Jesus, he can transform things. He turned water to wine. He can transform your life if you'll let him. He can transform a problem into something good. Wow. I heard about a, a man who was a skeptic. He got converted. And he was an alcoholic at one time. He got saved. And he was talking to a man about the Lord. And the man said, surely you don't believe that Bible thing about Jesus changing water into wine. Surely you don't believe that, do you? And he said, well, I don't have any difficulty believing Jesus could turn water into wine. If you'll come home with me, I'll show you how Christ changed beer into carpets, chairs, and a piano for my wife. He got saved, delivered from alcohol, and his money rather than going to booze went to good things. Jesus transforms. He's not a party pooper. And then let me, let me say this. Jesus saves the best for last. The devil does it opposite. He gets you started out. Boy, this is fun following the devil. Having this big party. And before you know it, sin ends up in tragedy for you. And Jesus says the best for last. I'm going to preach my friend's funeral Wednesday, part of it. He and I had a lot of good times together. He had a great life. He pitched baseball at LSU. Incredible man. He's just now really beginning to live. Jesus says the best for last. He left Minden Hospital today, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Father, we thank you today that when we study Scripture, we've analyzed some things about this passage, but what really stands out is that Jesus is not a party pooper and a killjoy. He don't mind celebrate and have a good time in life. He said, let the wedding continue. And that He transforms things, water to wine. He saves the best for last, and we're looking forward. 
to that day when we'll begin to experience the best. Bless my people here tonight as we go back to our homes. Thank you. Many of them are like me. They're tired. They worked hard all week in Bible school. Thank you for their labors of love, for their sacrifices, for their giving. Some of the sweetest people in the world right here in this room. Thank you for them and their spirit. Keep your hand on our church and bless us and meet our needs. And help us to keep preaching this gospel that Jesus makes a difference in a person's life. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Well, this Alabama watch that I'm wearing says it's three minutes after seven. And I wanted to get you out by seven or a couple of minutes before. So I got to keep working on it. Y'all can always run me off. (laughs) Please don't. All right. Have a good week.